Okay. Um, thanks. Thanks again for all our, our speakers. Very much appreciated. Um, so do we have any, uh, let me start off with, do we have any questions um, for any of the, the panelists? Maybe, uh, sure. So get the conversation started. All right, you go to first. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Francisco Raganisi. Just uh, from uh, listening to all your perspectives on uh, data management and the future of technology, just wanted to ask you, just curious, you know, the future, you know, where we're headed uh, in reference to blockchain and how it's going to change uh, the way we do things when it comes to data um, and security, Facebook, Twitter, like the whole, the whole industry itself. Thank you. So who wants to start off with that one? Ken? Yeah, I just want to say uh, 14 things. <laughs> Security, what we've learned from the panel today and what Michael, you and, and Alberto have done that makes this sort of activity so precious is that if I can use blockchain to make it easier for me to, I don't know, pollute something or abuse a worker or, 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 or do something else that was actually uncontroversially wrong beforehand, then it doesn't matter that I have better security or tools for doing so, right? The, the, the same thing with any other tool. Its use is gonna be shaped in part by your intentions and by your awareness of the consequences even if you don't intend something. That's why negligence can be blameworthy. Uh, and what I think we've all learned here today is that the, is is that while we, especially we North Americans, love proclaiming the rights that we uh, are expected to enjoy or have provided to us, what everybody has known in philosophy for a very long time is that that doesn't amount to much unless you also acknowledge your responsibilities. Uh, and we've done a pretty poor job of doing that. Blockchain will change the world, along with, and it's just, the, it's, it's the latest, it's the uh, security, security widget uh, uh, du jour. The next one will be even better. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about security that can't be cracked because that means that, that I, I'm, I, my Russian's actually not good enough. I don't want to live in a world in which people who have the best software get to control resources or, or economies. That was that was never part of the point of, of, of the liberating uh, vision that we had for, for the internet. Uh, and so I guess what I say is, yeah, we'll have better security and that hackers will have to try better to hack stuff. But at the end of the day, if we don't think of how to use these devices for, for intentions that we knew were better at the outset, it doesn't matter how secure we are in, in, in not doing so. You know, we keep looking for technical solutions to people problems. We keep looking for algorithms so that we can blame the algorithms. We keep looking for ways that we can not have to take responsibility for the blood on our hands. So, I mean, fuck blockchain. We got babies in chains. Let's take care of those. I'm I'm not looking f like tech solutions right now can don't you're not going to you're not going to fix something with the same tools that you use to break it. I have something to add. Um you, you know there's like a lot of myth around blockchain. It's like the new is like shiny toy. There's a lot of medium buzz and I think the point around technical solutions to like non-technical problems. The only examples where I've seen blockchain being like semi-beneficial or like interesting, we had a whole panel at the first Data for Black Lives conference about um, um, the, the music industry and you know, historically black musicians, musicians of color, female musicians don't get royalty payments. Like there's people who are not making money and even today, right? Especially from these massive streaming platforms that you know makes so much money, Apple, Spotify, barely any of it goes to the artists. So there's some really cool experiments that are going around, artist-led, where they're trying to fix that. And yeah, it's a you know a, a larger problem, which is just total injustice and inequality um, in the music industry. Um, but it's cool to see people, at least you know, artists, musicians, black musicians. Um, there's one person, Dobby from Clef Play. Who's, who's working on this. Um, 
people of the Berkeley School of Music Open Music Initiative. Um, so that's like that's one piece of the puzzle. But um, again, I think I I like this larger point of let's not how do we not kind of focus on this like silver bullet? How do we focus like larger systemic change, whether it's to banking and finance or like uh, the music industry? What about another question for any of our panelists? Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a senior here at the University of Miami studying computer science. So I've been thinking a lot actually about data concentrations or data as capital, I suppose. So I'm not entirely sure how to say this in a brief way, but I'll try. So simply machine learning, like a fundamental principle of machine learning algorithms is that the more data you have and the more representative data you have, the better your outcomes are. The more the more accurate your algorithms tend to be, according to what, of course, depending on what you're having it optimize, as you said. But what this does mean in practice is that, say, for a market that has some specific criterion, and if you're producing something for that criterion, or criteria rather, and you have the most data, say you are Facebook, you are Google, you are someone with very large platforms, very large inflows of data, you are always going to be able to produce the best service. So if you have companies who are able to accumulate a lot of fiscal capital because they produce services that are very good because of their accumulation of data, and that also gives them more access to more data, how do you go about like changing that? I, I mean, I understand uh, your proposal for, a, for having a data trust, but the issue is when there is so much fiscal capital invested in data already, should there perhaps be, like, should there perhaps be something along the lines of uh, considering data as a form of capital or as property and giving somehow divesting controlled individuals? Like, do you have any thoughts on this? For me specifically? Uh, anyone who's involved oh, okay. with it, I think for you also because you've uh, directly addressed like, yeah, data ownership. Yeah, I can talk about it and I want everybody to ch chime in too. You know, I think the one of the ways that our data trust is very different from other examples is that, you know, like for example, like Element AI was working directly with Microsoft, who has the capital, so to speak, right? For us, yes, we're thinking about how do we actually get the data and that's where like the actual movement building and direct action and advocacy has to come in, right? It's making these demands, but also most importantly, building the mass movement to put pressure <laughs> on companies to not just give over data, but to change these structures, financial, um, technical, um, that allow this problem to exist and also to persist, right? So I mean, one example for, you know, beyond Facebook is like genetics data, right? You know, I think it should be illegal that 23 and Me is like saying, oh yeah, you want to find out like where in Africa you're from, you know, because you don't know, like take this DNA test. And now we're learning that they're selling it to Glasgow Smith Klein, to like all these pharmaceutical companies to create drugs, right? Like, you know, I think, you know, there were so many solid, amazing points made today around like, obviously we live in a uh, political environment where regulation is doing the opposite. But like, I do believe in organizing. I do believe in direct action. And I do believe collectively we have the power, not just to say we're going to stop doing these DNA tests, but to demand, you know, better, more ethical use of our data and actually to hold that. And, you know, and I think obviously in, in places like the UK, they have GDPR, they have more, um, well, huh? Right, no, excuse me, right, no longer the UK. That's recent development too, right? So anyway, they uh, they have GDPR over there. And, you know, states like California, but, you know, I think it's, you know, we believe in this longer haul, long-term battle, but most importantly, these everyday people, right? How do we put in their imagination, not only understanding what an algorithm is, what their data means individually and as big data, but... Um, educating people to then mobilize, like building political consciousness to say, you know, we need to abolish these structures, right? And I think that's why this framework on abolition is so important. Um, and I'm going to say it again: direct action, organizing too. So, um, and you know, we 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 see examples of that happening in in the tech worker space. How can we see it happening more in the data justice? Data. I mean, there's some weird language for for some data trust, which comes out of trust law around data subject, which is weird. But you know, in the individuals who are making these companies so profitable, right? So anyway, we could talk more about that offline. But I want people to also contribute to this because I think um, this capital thing is one of the reasons why we see these problems as being so insurmountable. 
even though so much of the valuations of these companies are like made up, right? It's not, that's not really how much they're worth or they're like working at a loss. Does any other panelists want to jump on that? Or just Octavio? falling uh, on those points. Um, I think there is one, one other side of the story, which is the users, right? So of course, as long as you have your own Facebook account and you use it, um, you're part of what empowers Facebook, right? So the other thing is to think about as a user what you can do, right? To resist, constrain, limit, and put some order in uh, in the company. It's uh, it's very easy, I think, for all of us faced with the new technology to have a sense of powerlessness. Oh, there's nothing I can do. You know, the technology will come in and swipe things away. And then that's that, right? Uh, whereas often, uh, there are a lot of options uh, among users to change things and d redirect uh, in, in ways that hopefully are a little more rational and, and sustainable, right? Of course, this requires coordination, requires vision, requires, requires some sense of purpose. Uh, but it's not undoable, right? Well, it's hope with a plan, right? The other word for that is guillotine. <laughs> well, another way of putting that is that is I, I don't I don't my days on the barric I hurt my back and the barricades are like hurt my back. We don't a, a direct action is a beautiful thing, but in this country nowadays. I'm not sure how many people you're going to get to do that as opposed to taking quiet, small steps in your life to eliminate corruption from it. Otavia has made a brilliant point. It, Facebook and what it's done, speaking of the UK, so, so Facebook and uh, went to Brexit. Facebook went to President, uh, what's your president's name? Trump, yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> and, and we walked into it eyes wide open and smiling. Uh, we have empowered all sorts of interesting evil in part by inaction where the counterpoint is not necessarily a lot. I, I direct action is a beautiful thing. And if you can get people to show up, uh, then that is a beautiful thing. But turn off Facebook for a while. Uh, turn off Amazon for a while. That we have wet regularly allowed ourselves to be bought and sold because we're actually pretty cheap. You show us human shiny objects, it's amazing what you can get us to do. The responsibility that is, that's associated now with technology is one that was available, well, when, when, the big, when the big oil monopolies were created. The model that they found, formed was this. If everybody here is an oil company, uh, and I'm standard oil, I come in, it's, you all sound like heating oil so people don't freeze. You're 20 cents a, a, a gallon, you're 21, you're, you're 24, you're 23. I come in, I start selling it for 19 cents. Well, you can't afford that, so you drop out. So by the time I get to 15 cents, y'all have gone out of business. And so I get to charge whatever I want. That's the model of free markets. And what we've discovered, and Microsoft actually perfected it in, in, in the digital world, right? All you need to do is destroy your competition. You'll call it free enterprise, because prepending pre free in front of something, it just makes it just, just makes it really delicious. Um, and, 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 and the outcry there was what? Where was the outcry? We looked at that and said, well, that's just looks like free enterprise. Um, and it was coming at a time, of course, when people thought that regulation was indistinguishable from Stalinism, uh, and that set the world back a, a couple of generations. Uh, one does not need to be, the, the debate I think doesn't need to be about how free you want your economies. It's to be how free you want to be in your, for our purposes in our digital lives and how much responsibility we're willing to take and expect our leaders to, to provide for us. We've done a pretty uh, a slovenly job in both accounts. I just want to add one other thing. I agree strongly with everything they've said. Um, I'm going to add two things. One, I'm from Toronto, and Toronto is doing a great job at pushing back on Google. Um, Toronto is uh, Google's trying to turn our lakefront, our waterfront, which is you know one of the best parts of Toronto, into a quote unquote smart city, and um, it's been successfully blocked several times now. Um, so there, you could look there for some examples. But but I think my more important contribution is that I'd actually like to question the technical premise of, of your question in that um, 
that having more data optimizes machine learning outcomes better and makes the results more accurate. And I, I do understand that that is what you have been taught. And I do think that the fact that we are teaching bright young people like yourself in computer science, um, things like that <laughs> is extraordinarily problematic because uh, even on a technical mathematical level, that is not actually true. Um, and so the perception that these giant companies that have this giant amount of data are in fact that powerful is a mirage. Um, and I think the way that we teach computer science and the assumptions that we embed in our computer science curriculums, I mean, when I, you know, I'm very, very much in favor. So please never take what I'm about to say out of context. I'm very much in favor of diversifying the pipeline and the staff. I'm like, yes, that's a big problem. But if we take a whole bunch of diverse people and put them in the same training programs that we have, we're just going to make like diverse people that all have these really um, incorrect and racist, colonial, homophobic mathematical formulas in their heads. <laughs> so so um, I'd be careful with that. You've raised Can, a philosophical yeah. point. It dawns on me, one of these, any minute, Michael, you're going to say, oh my goodness, look at the hour. Um, no, no, no. I was, I was, I was going to say. But I wanted to. It, it dawns on me as I look up. around the room. May I do? May I do a, 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 an unapproved research project right now? How many of you are from the University of Miami? Super. How many of you are not from the University of Miami? So, so just th that strikes me as pretty exciting about our community. How many of you are from FIU? How many of you are from um, another university beside FIU and UM? Where are you from? Welcome. Um, <laughs> how many of you are? How many of you are business people? How many of you are people who work in information technology at UM or elsewhere? Where are the lawyers sitting? <laughs> uh, Professor Frumkin has done a lot of very exciting work at UM and elsewhere with his We Robots program, which I commend you with some of these issues are raised there as well. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of who's in the room and, and why you're here. Because one of the things about iDisc, and it's part of the vision I think that I find exciting, is universities can create centers and institutes all the time. What part of the vision for iDisc is, is including our community uh, that, and, and maybe even to addressing problems. Uh, it might be a climate change problem. It also might be a, a, a other problems that are actually not ethically very interesting. Uh, but now there's technology where it might be the unintended consequences are worth addressing. Or it might be that, that apropos your point, um, I, I would actually tend to disagree. I think more data or more information whether it's computed or not, is the way science progresses. That if, if you've got accurate data and accurate information, then you're better able to confirm uh, or falsify a hypothesis. Uh, and that's good for science. That we tend to throw a bunch of stuff, call it data, into a box and shake it and call that um, research is probably a mistake. You're right there. But at the end of the day, we want there to be a foundation for achieving knowledge as opposed to uh, opinion. <laughs> but I, I think we conflate lots of data with quality data. Fair point. So I mean, that's the point I made. What, what's your name? What Daniel said was the company that has, I'm going to paraphrase Daniel, tell me if I'm wrong, the company who has the most data wins. Somebody owns all the platforms. Sorry. Uh, the point is like, if you're someone who has all the platforms, if you're at Amazon and you have both a shopping service, you also have information on what people are interacting with. Even if like, the point is that like, you do have a lot of data and that can itself form a kind of quality. And what are yeah. we doing with all that data, Daniel? I don't think I should have it if I'm Amazon. Or I mean, we've got more data at our fingertips right now than at any point in the history of the world. How are we doing? But I mean, how is the world doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why the hell would you want to be Jeff Bezos? See, here's, here's, here. All right, I'm going to go off. <clears throat> so, so here's the thing. I talked to 
to, to students all over the place. And, you know, they're, they're, they're smart as hell and they're well-meaning. And I got to say, this generation of students gives me a lot more hope than the last generation of students. Um, I talked to some this afternoon who were great. Uh, but what, if, when you start bringing up ethical dilemmas to people, they start solving it for the company. They start solving it, well, the company has to make money. Uh, well, I'm afraid if we were to fix that, then how could Amazon make money? Why do you care? Why do you care if Amazon makes money? Great. I mean, but, and then we forget that there's a human being on the other side of that. And we end up by, it's a, it's, it's a, I don't know if it's a weird American thing or what, but our, our default mode is to solve for the company instead of solving for the community that that company is affecting. If, if, if your business model can't succeed without destroying a community, then screw your business model. Go out of business. Um, I think the point about quality data is, is incredibly important. Who is this data coming from? Who, who is putting it together? Why are they putting it together? What are they trying to find out? Because, I mean, data can say anything that you want it to say. It's all about who's putting it together. And right now, we have been historically excluding a ton of people from collecting that data. And I mean, you, I mean, you spoke uh, about this in your talk. Um, and what was what was the, the the woman who's collecting missing data? I'm sorry, I forget her name. Was that you? <laughs> wait, 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 Mike, me, Mike, let me, me actually me let me bring a couple other viewpoints. Um, I don't want to cut you off, but we have a couple other questions, so I just want to bring in a couple other viewpoints. And Hi, uh, my name is Mark Russell. Um, I just uh, want to ask, uh, we thought, you mentioned informed consent earlier, I believe, Dr. Bueno, and um, it came to mind that, you know, you walk into as uh, an emergency room today and you you get a whole bunch of paperwork shoved in your face that you feel you absolutely have to sign off on everything just so that you can get treated. Um, that's one of one of the things. But people don't don't seem to care as much about they they want to get treated. They don't they're not concerned about being informed specifically. They're not going to read through that entire form. How do we get people, the people in this room, I'm sure, care about being informed, but how do we get the other, the rest of the world to be concerned about being informed? Well, I think, I think that's a great question, right? And uh, in part, uh, it's, well, I'm at a university because I care about informing people and forming uh, generations. Uh, I really believe that people will be able to make better decisions if they are better informed, including they will be able to get better treatment uh, if they could ask good questions to their you know, health care providers. Of course, if they're equipped to ask good questions, not the questions that are suggested by drug uh, advertisers. Well, tell your doctor about X, right? That's, those are not the good questions. But if they get good questions about the sources of you know, the, the disease that they have, uh, side effects of possible treatment alternatives, balances of costs with uh, styles of living and all kinds of things, um, they will be able to get better treatment. So a genuine informed consent is one there's the informed part is the, you know, absolutely crucial on that. The consent is easy, as you say, you just sign it. Right? The, the important part is to provide the relevant information. Right? Of course, there are all kinds of additional constraints. There's time that you know, the physician is there, there's a list of people you need to go, he or she needs to go through you know, in that day. Um, so there are additional complications to be uh, taken care of. But um, I think if, if we equip people with tools for them to ask good questions, they'll be able to make better decisions. 
What are the forms? I can have a friendly amendment to that. In asking a question, it reminded me, in an, in an emergency room, actually what I want to do is I want to trust you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to fill out a form. But when I do sign papers quickly, well, the last time y'all were online and you were asked to read the information and accept the conditions before you got the free software, y'all read that very carefully before you accept it, right? We, we, we want to give this up as quickly as possible because it's an inconvenience. And what you do is it's, it's not that you trust the company as much as you trust it's not it, 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 that you won't come to grief as a result of it. Yeah, you lose some benefit. You've given away something of value and the emergency department, something similar happens. But if I'm in a hospital that I trust, I don't. I, I, I want, it's, it's not so much the emergency department, it's when I've got a really complex case of cancer and you've got 14 different drugs, and the side effects are different. That's when the educated person is gonna be able to ask good questions uh, and meet the other criteria for, for valid consent, which is voluntariness. Being informed and then being coerced does not make for, for, for a good process. Um, it does, one more question, how many Canadians are here? Sure, I mean, I'll do my survey. Um, so How many people are not from the United States here originally? Uh, bienvenido. Uh, despite what you've heard, uh, it's it's false. Um, and, I, and you inspired me because I um, and taught me a new definition. If someone said, do you know what a Canadian is? Yeah, it's an unarmed American with health care. Um, Canadians we, do not accept so, that definition. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we have not, in, in terms of the values that we're talking about, and the reason why, why this session, uh, as conceived by Michael and Alberto, is so important is we're, we're trying at every step of the way to, to try and get things right with new technology. And that's sometimes going to be tricky. We haven't done a very good job with other technologies for what it's worth. Uh, and so when it comes to informed consent in a digital hospital, or informed consent online, or informed consent in any number of places where that core uh, 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 expression of self-determination or autonomy really matters, we're not very good at it. Uh, and, and it's not because it was, it, and, and because we're not good at it, it's easily exploitable. Uh, it's why, it's why in, in business school we teach that you can actually make a whole lot of money with, with good products that, that don't erode other values. Solid businesses are a wonderful opportunity. But if you're a business person, please make good businesses. And you can make a lot of money without, without trading on people's weaknesses, biases, and, and, and uncertain about whether they can trust you. Okay, with that, I know we had three more questions. I do apologize. I'm gonna invite Alberto to the stage one more time to close it out and uh, show one more thing. So Alberto, would you like to? And uh, let's thank our panelists. In the meantime, thank you very much.